Um, now, thank you very much. Now, we, we would like to move to um, Eduardo Gonzalez Pierre, who was at the center of the response to H1N1 in Mexico. And uh, we are very you know, happy that it um, ended so well. Um, but it didn't have to. And um, you were responsible for the treasury functions and the risk analysis. So um, please, um, could you um, 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 describe how the, um, the chain of expenditure, the, ex uh, the, the way the, the expenditures um, were managed, um, how it was um, um, facilitating or otherwise the response, and can you uh, talk about how the government dealt with the pressures on the budget that H1N1 uh, presented and what uh, kind of things could have been done um, differently, better, what went well? Thank you. Th thank you, Olga, and uh, thank you for the invite to the organizers. Um, let me start by, of course, we'll switch to influenza here and to Mexico 2009, which has very uh, relevant lessons even for the Ebola case. In fact, there was a review in 2011 with a lot of lessons learned which are still applicable to the uh, current phase. But uh, one important message uh, for the Mexi in the Mexican case is that um, having the funding or having the funding mechanisms is not a sufficient condition for an effective supply res uh, spending response. So, so, so that's important. And, and let me talk about what happened in the Mexican case. And there, you can identify three clear stages of uh, the succession of events. The timeline is very important. One clear stage is the, uh, the alerts, when the uh, epidemic, the emergency gets classified and eventually uh, um, uh, officially uh, declared. The second phase is where the spending gets triggered. And a third stage for the Mexican case is where the funding gets resolved. And of course, Mexico is a, is a country which has access to capital markets. And it's a middle income country which, which has um, some experience on that. But uh, let me go over the events to, to just uh, make the case on, on this clear. Number one, the, the epidemic probably started in March. And uh, it was confused with the seasonal outbreaks. There were early warnings on acute respiratory diseases by mid-March. By um, the 6th of April, PAJO and the Ministry of Health confirmed an important outbreak in the state of uh, Veracruz, which is in the eastern part of the country. And uh, according to uh, international health regulations, it was reported to the WHO as a possible emergency of international concern, and data was shared with Canada and with the US. Then soon after, the cases evolved very rapidly, and the uh, Taipei virus was identified. And it was uh, on the 23rd of April, and the dates here are important to see the response capacity, that uh, independent analysis from Canada and from C CDC were confirmed. It was confirmed there was a new virus, an AH H1N1, and it was present in uh, both samples. Now, in Mexico on the 24th, this was a Friday, the General Health Council, which is an entity which is uh, designed to do emergency response, issued the emergency. And it was on Saturday the 25th that uh, WHO declared the uh, emergency of international concern. And at the same time, and this is important, the president issued, on the same day, issued a decree whereby the emergency, the influenza emergency was declared. And, and this was important, and I'll, I'll talk about it in a, in a few minutes, because that was necessary to trigger some specific mechanisms for expedited, expedited spending. By the 29th of, uh, of April, four days later, the uh, procurement was taking place. The first contracts were being um, signed. And um, by the end of the outbreak, uh, August 2010, uh, about $600 million were being spent, had been spent over the period. Uh, over the period, about 72,000 
72,000 cases were confirmed and about uh, 1,300 deaths were confirmed. Now, the, the, the process was, was fast. I think it was, there was an expedited response and it was a, a very, very timely um, uh, capacity for the purchase of medicines and the purchase of supplies. Now, what, uh, what I think is important is to link that even though the funds <coughs> would have been possible <coughs> early on, and we have to remember that at, the, at that stage, Mexico, well, the rest of the, uh, the world, but specifically Mexico, was going through a very difficult economic crisis. Overall, in 2009, there was a drop in GDP of uh, 6.8%. So, so the government was very short of, uh, of uh, general funds. There was even talk about budget cuts in the Ministry of Health at the, at the time. So what, uh, what is important eventually is that the funds were found from specific uh, reserves that are part of the two major insurance, public insurance entities, one of them being the Social Security Agency, the other one being the Ministry of Finance, Finance um, Insurance Scheme. And they have special funding from which about half of the $600 million were placed by Social Security, and the other half was uh, funded by uh, Seguro Popular or the uh, Ministry of Health uh, Agency for funding. Uh, my, my most important uh, message here is that it is important to delink what happens, what this, how the um, emergency triggers the spending how fast the spending takes place, and what things can be financially solved in advance, and some things that need to be financially solved afterwards. In fact, and you're probably well aware, Olga, yeah. to resolve the financing a few months later, the Mexican government asked for an IBRD loan. It was a $491 million loan, which fell through. It eventually was uh, canceled in early 2011, but I think that's an interesting case of it how is. things should be res get resolved afterwards to just make sure that the, uh, mm -hmm. that the budgets are found. And second, what the uh, response capacities of organizations are before the emergency and then what can be resolved after the emergency with, with obviously um, the proper uh, mechanisms and the caps and everything that makes things uh, sufficiently reliable. Thank you. Okay. Um, now, if I, if I can f follow up on this, on the availability of, of funding and how it's deployed in the emergency, in the, in the case of the H1N1 response in Mexico, um, the Social Security Fund and the other funds that were mobilized, is this something that was foreseen in the emergency response plans of the government, that these funds could be drawn on, or is it something that you decided only during the response? Mm -hmm. And then also, how was the procurement expedited um, because of the emergency legislation that, that was in effect, or the regulations that were in effect because of the declaration of the emergency? Mm -hmm. Or was there some, you know, something done exposed on procurement that had to uh, um, you know, in order to get the things done. That's an important case. The, the Mexican law, and especially the specific procurement laws, have all these provisions, which usually don't get used, and people don't know much about them. So they get triggered at a very, uh, uh, let's say, difficult stage. In, in the case of Mexico, there were funds which were under the title of a catastrophic spending um, uh, funding, and then there were other provisions. Of course, there's a long tradition with uh, other type of emergencies, most, mostly uh, natural disasters. But for epidemics, there was not a very important uh, background and experience. What, what is important is that um, the country, and in the case of Mexico, is very useful. There were some automatic legal provisions that were triggered with the uh, national decree. On the 25th of April, once the WHO declared the uh, emergency, 
and the Mexican president issued the decree, all these provisions were triggered and that allowed for very fast possibility of spending the funds, mostly procuring the funds. Eventually the funds were um, uh, returned to the budget and, uh, and the spending, the uh, eventual uh, use of the funds took place. But what, what is important is to have a map of all the provisions that could be used if the emergency gets uh, declared. And those usually those are legal provisions which countries are not very much aware of or the current administration which hasn't used them, it doesn't know how to put them in place. So having all that ready and understanding how the framework works is very, very important for uh, procurement when it needs to be done. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, can you also um, explain how um, automatic was it that the H1N1 pandemic became a disaster under the emergency regulations that are in place? Um, because sometimes you know, people say, oh, no, it's a disease. It's, you know, it's, not part, it's not a natural disaster. But in fact, it should be the same, you know, part of the same framework for responding. Um, and so was that already done in Mexico, or did you have to repair something during the event? So, yes, uh, things don't move, especially on the procurement level if the, if the emergency doesn't get declared. What, what was fortunate in the Mexican case is that was on the same day that WHO declared the um, emergency of public concern and the president issued the decree, and that pretty much facilitated everything. If WHO hadn't done it at the same time that the Mexico had declared it, then there would have been a mismatch and you would have had an emergency without triggering the spending, or you could have it the other way around. So I think um, international coordination of when a pandemic is severe enough to trigger the uh, mechanisms and how that triggers the local procurement strategies is very, very important. No, no country or no institution, even if it has the funding, is gonna go and bypass all the bidding procedures if it doesn't have the, the, um, the guarantees that it's not gonna fall into some sort of a mis mismanagement of funds. And the last question, has, has H1N1 response changed the way that the government budgets for contingencies in, 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 the, in the annual budget? Is there some more, um, say, preparation of the amount that may be needed in extreme events such as a pandemic or severe, severe no, epidemic? No, I, don't, I don't think so. I, once the emergency is over, everybody goes back to... Uh, where, where things left and nothing takes place. I, I hope it doesn't happen this time because it happened in 2009 with the revisions that were um, suggested by the um, expert group. And in the Mexican case, once the pandemic was over, um, there was an anti-climax. Things went back to normal. There wasn't really much of a, a reaction in terms of changing the legal frameworks or uh, putting special contingency funds, which is unfortunate. I think there were lessons to be learned, but. Uh, it, 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 it is the case that um, you move on to something else and uh, you don't think about it until the next time. The next crisis arrives. It, I mean, the costs to Mexican economy were not trivial. Although, you know, the, the pandemic ended up to be very, um, you know, sort of mild and the costs were quite high for the tourism industry in the spring, right? And the, the, those are the, the trade-offs when you, when you issue the decree. The trade-offs are... Uh, the damage to the economy that the decree could make. In the Mexican case, there were a lot of, there was more damage done economically than there was eventually in health terms. Right, well, and, I think it's actually, unfortunately, true even with Ebola. Right? Yes. I mean, it's so yes. devastating in West Africa. Okay, thanks a lot.